Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. And I'm Carl Shute. Today, we're going to uh, discuss Tom Wolfe's book, The Painted Word. Yes. We bought this thing on Amazon. I, I hate that. I hate to have to buy books from Amazon. I hate to have to buy anything from Amazon, by the way. Uh, but it's by Picador Press. And a little book, 100 pages. And uh, we're going to get into that thing. But you said you've been working on Walden, because we're going to do a show on Walden uh, next week. Yes. And that's my favorite. Do you love it? I do. It's such an eloquent, wonderful... Screed. Bomb-throwing defense of laziness. Yeah. We're working to build a telegram line from Maine to Texas, but Maine and Texas don't have anything to talk about. They don't want to even speak to each other. Yeah. <laughs> it's from 1840. Henry David Thoreau, it's kind of famous. He went out and built a cabin and lived in the woods for a couple of years. It's pretty much a tiny house. Tiny houses are kind of trendy now, these little tiny... But he went and he built it himself. He just got a pile of wood and built it himself, dug out the cellar. It was $28 for the house. He tells you. He gives you the bill. Exquisite, perfect bookkeeping, down to the quarter penny. Yeah, and he's sh trying to show you, you don't need to work very hard. Yeah, he wants to drive life into a corner, he says. It's eye-opening. I remember reading a little bit of it in high school. They would We would read a bit of this and a bit of civil disobedience, and I know I didn't read the good parts because if I had, it would have made me much more constructively lazy in my life because it is i keep writing in the margins why so angry bro you know he's just mad yeah. all the time and it's wonderful and uh, i'm looking forward to talking about it in a future podcast yeah go pick up uh, walden archive.org you know it's out of copyright you can get it anywhere you know read whatever you can if you can't read the whole darn thing by next week you know read first chapter on economy at least and uh, follow along we'll be talking about that but today we've got tom wolf Yes. Love me some Tom Wolfe. How good is that guy? I have read a few of his things. I read, was it Diary of Charlotte Simmons? I am Charlotte Simmons. I am Charlotte Simmons. I think that might be the one big novel of his that I've read. I've re read his thing on language, which was funny. It was about language and Darwin and all sorts of... He, he go, He's like a podcast. He goes wherever he wants to, and you're happy to enjoy the ride. He's funny. His language is perfect. Oh, he's so freaking smart. If you're interested... This is on my bookshelf to read at some point. He's the man who wrote The Right Stuff. About the space program. Which I hear is wonderful, but I haven't read yet. I read uh, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test when I was a post-adolescent, when I read, you know, Dharma Bombs and On the Road and all that stuff, like you're supposed to when you're 15. Whoa, that's a period I'd like to explore. Yeah? <laughs> what? <laughs> of you reading your beatnik stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you have a beret? No, I did not. Uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Read all that, all that stuff, and then read Electric Kool Aid Acid Test in that same period. Was that when you read Catcher in the Rye? No, I was a grown ass man when I read that. I was, I had two kids at least. <laughs> it was terrible. Wish I had that part of my life back. <laughs> Catcher in the Rye. This wolf thing. You know, he's this weird mid century American phenomenon of these sort of people that write journalism and literature. And uh, memoir and a whole bunch of things all wrapped in one. I think it's a really interesting genre that straddles two or three or four different things, you know. Uh, Wolf is a master of it. And I'll tell you who my favorite is that does this sort of thing is John McPhee. You ever read any McPhee? Mm -mm. He wrote a book called Oranges. It was just about the orange industry in Florida and uh, orange juice concentrate. And it's just a deep dive on that industry. And he writes beautifully. It's like Tom Wolf. You're like, you're just hanging on every word about oranges. He famously wrote a book about a professional basketball player. I think it was maybe Bill Bradley. Yeah, Sense of Where You Are. He wrote a book about Bill Bradley where he just followed him around. And he just wrote this beautiful literature, really, about observing a little weird niche of, uh, of American life. He wrote one about truckers. Anyway, McPhee is like like Wolf, and I really I really enjoy this kind of thing where a keen observer who writes beautifully throws the window open and lets us look in on some piece of the world that we couldn't see without them. 
Well, that's an interesting take. I, I have diverse thoughts now. Okay. What part of that's an interest, interesting take first? Well, talking about how they're revealing little bits of reality to you that you wouldn't ordinarily see. And then your last line about not seeing it without the people, which goes right into the painted word. So let me tell you my story from yesterday. Mm. Yesterday, I went up to the gym on the north side of Chicago. I live in the south side. I don't live in Chicago. I live in an unnamed suburb in the southwest part of the suburbia. And so I had to get up early and go for a 6 a.m. So I got up at 4.15 and I drove up there and the guy didn't show. Uh. I sat there and talked to my friend Mark, who's one of the people at the gym. And he was having a good day in the gym and we were chatting about all the things we like to do. And I went medieval on him. I told him... <laughs> The medievals thought that being and truth and goodness and beauty were convertible, which means that anything that is, is also beautiful, which means that I like hearing all the cool stuff that everybody likes to do because it's a reflection of reality. Then he took exception to that, being Mark, if he ever listens to this, he'll know. And uh, he questioned the notion of truth, whether there was any such thing as truth. That is so boring to me at this point. Well, we had a fun hour and a half. I had to wait for the traffic to clear anyway. Sure, sure. But it, it maps into the art world, okay? Because you like Tom Wolfe, as do I, and you like John McPhee, because they're revealing to you little bits of ordinary life that have their own interest. Who cares about oranges, you might think? But I bet the book's really good. Oh, it's I ribbit. bet there's something to care about with oranges. It's Everything is neat if you look at it close enough with the right attitude. And so writers like this will reveal it. Uh, when we get into the art world, uh, one of the themes of the book is 20th century art. Well, it's a reaction against realism. Realism would be painting pictures that look like stuff. Okay, basically, I was thinking about this. There were no styles in ancient Greek sculpture. Right. Like, it was just, we're going to make beautiful stuff. I mean, you didn't have, Phidias didn't have a cubic period where he just did cubes. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> it's generally realist. And the artists might emphasize different things, but it's generally realist. Is generally trying to show, I would say, it's trying to show beauty. Uh, if you don't, as the modern age does with its doubts about truth, what kind of art can you make if you don't believe that there's something to make art about? Yeah, if you don't believe there's a there's truth or that there's an objective reality, there's no subject matter. Yeah, and so I, I was started thinking about art about a year ago. I'm not an artist myself. I sketch very little and badly, but I like looking at pretty stuff. And so I had found this website, artrenewal.org, a long, long time ago, that uh, is in defense of realism. And I would go and look at their paintings every now and then. Fantastic stuff by modern artists. They have contests for people. And they had a an associated school, the Da Vinci Initiative. And I'm just mentioning this because uh, I think the founder, Mandy Thies, is I think how you pronounce her name. She was on a podcast and I listened to it and said something very interesting on the podcast. I believe it's the, the Thriving Artists podcast. And she was on it and she and uh, Daniel degrees, I think is how you pronounce it. We're talking about this. This is an amazing fact that if you go into the art gallery to buy art as a collector, you don't know if it's good. There is no way for you, the consumer, the potential collector, to know if modern art is any good. <sighs> Whereas ancient art, you can look at it and say, yeah, that's good. Is there any doubt that Michelangelo is good? Not among the sane. But in order to look at modern, abstract, non-realist art and to know if it's good, and they said, you have to ask the critic. Like, is there anything else that we would do that any sane person would do that would be like that? You go to a restaurant and you eat whatever they put on their plate and you have to turn and look over your shoulder and ask an expert if it was any good. Was the foie gras any good? Right. Was the, you know? Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's the, you build a house and you go live in it and then the architect comes by and says, uh, well, this is an old style and all of a sudden your house is no good. It doesn't keep out the rain. Right. 
<sighs> so I thought it was put really well. That was an interesting podcast about needing. I mean, young art students, you have to teach them how to draw nowadays because uh, they don't know anymore. Basic technique apparently isn't taught very much. Because what do you need it for if you're doing Jackson Pollock abstract expressionism, dripping paint on a canvas? What technique do you need for that? Modern art's a weird thing. And this book came up on the internet, recommended. I thought, I'm going to read that. And I did, and it was funny. And then I said, Scott, you should read it. And then he read it. And what did you think? Uh, I did. It's it's Tom Wolfe, man. It's just so smart. He's just such a keen observer. He's such a good storyteller. He's such a good writer. It's fun and it just lilts along. And again, he gives us an insight into a world that I could not see otherwise. And it's not that I not that I need somebody to mediate it. I don't have a, a passport into the uh, New York City world of modern art and art critics. That whole weird thank God, by the way, uh, that whole weird <laughs> circle. But Tom Wolfe, being Tom Wolfe in the seventies. If he knocked, people opened the door, and uh, and he was able to go and, and uh, investigate this world and report it back to us. Is he like Andy Warhol? Is he the odd person pretending to be, or is he the normal person pretending to be the odd person? I think he's an odd person pretending to be normal. Like he always wore a suit, you know, and like a straw hat, and always looked right. And he's kind of like an alien, you know. Whenever he sees something, he sees it completely new. Yeah. And like, I remember being a little kid and seeing women would paint their fingernails red. I'm like, that's so crazy. They're painting their fingernails like <laughs> blood colored, like talons. Like, what's happening here? Yep. What's happening? And so I was able to see that outside of any context, like an alien would see it. I think he's able to do that with all kinds of things. Of course, he carries his baggage to it because he's Tom Wolfe and he's very opinionated, but uh, uh, it's wonderful. And he kicks this thing off. First sentence, he quotes Marshall McLuhan. Isn't that funny? Mm-hmm. Uh, we, so we just read Marshall McLuhan's Ass Wipe, the media is the massage. <laughs> and he said, he kicks this off. People don't read the morning newspaper, Marshall McLuhan once said. They slip into it like a warm bath. And he, so he said he was just skating through the morning paper like we do. And then something extraordinary happened. He noticed something in the paper. Uh, in the art in the art section of the, the New York Times, where uh, they wrote that realism does not lack its partisans, but it does rather conspicuously lack a persuasive theory. And given the nature of our intellectual commerce with works of art, to lack a persuasive theory is to lack something crucial. The means by which our experience of individual works is joined to our understanding of the values they signify. That woke him up, and that was the genesis of this book. That's a quote from Hilton Kramer that he noticed. Well, what's the thing in there that's of note? And I, I love the language around it. Can I, I want, can I read the paragraph before that? Of course. Because I want to give you a flavor of Tom Wolfe. This is right after he says he slipped into the newspaper like a warm bath. Soon I was submerged, weightless, suspended in the tepid depths of the thing in the arts and leisure, section two, page 19, in the state of perfect sensory deprivation, when all at once an extraordinary thing happened. I noticed something. Yet another clam broth colored current had begun to roll over me, as warm and predictable as a Gulf Stream. A review, it was, by the Times Dean of the Arts, Hilton Kramer, of an exhibition at Yale University of Seven Realists, Seven Realistic Painters, when I was jerked alert by the following, and then the quote that you read about realism lacking a persuasive theory. Now you may say, my God, man, you woke up over that. You forsake your blissful coma over a mere swell in the sea of words. But I knew what I was looking at. I realized that without making the slightest effort, I'd come upon one of those utterances in search of which psychoanalysts and State Department monitors of the Moscow or Belgrade press are willing to endure a lifetime of tedium, namely the seemingly innocuous obiter dicta, the words in passing that give the game away. What I saw before me was the critic in chief of the New York Times saying, in looking at a painting today, to lack a persuasive theory is to lack something crucial. I read it again. It didn't say something helpful or enriching or even extremely valuable. No, the word was crucial. In short, frankly, these days, without a theory to go with it, I can't see a painting. And that's Tom Wolfe. That's Tom Wolfe. He's a generous guy. And so I, I, but I can imagine that that made him angry. I can't see a painting. No, you can't see it. How dare you? You can't see it without knowing the theory around it. 
Think about that. Like that's what uh, they were talking about in the podcast I listened to. You can't know if a painting is good unless somebody tells you if it's good. This is just a fact, or at least it was a fact in the 20th century. Yeah, that's right. I don't know the art world now. I like the painting on the front cover. Did you see that? Yeah. This is a Norman Rockwell painting called The Connoisseur. You can look it up if you can spell connoisseur. I had to be careful about that. It's a French word. And it is a man in a suit, in a gray suit. Much like Tom Wolfe would have been. Very stylish. Standing there looking at a Jackson Pollock or an imitation of a Jackson Pollock done by Norman Rockwell. I think it's actually better than Jackson Pollock. There's more structure. And so he's standing there looking at random, to me, random drips on a canvas. And you can imagine somebody comes up to you if you're standing there confused. Isn't it breathtaking? It's a perfect example of the fuliginous flatness. Fuliginous flatness. Wolf says that in this modern art, uh, people stand before that and they're waiting. They're waiting for the visual reward to come into focus. And it just never happens. Yeah. There's no amount of time that you could spend in front of the, the Pollock splatter art and realize anything but a, a loathing of Jackson Pollock, probably. Well, no, there could be a different vector on this. So let's say you do know the theory, which for Pollock, it's we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but it's Greenberg's flatness, everything mm-hmm. flatness. And so you look at it, and that's how I was quoting that the thick fuliginous flatness of Jackson Pollock. Because, you see, ancient paintings were painting illusions. They were three-dimensional, which isn't real. The canvas is two-dimensional, but if you look at um, Frangelico or something where he's doing primitive, I don't know, he's doing exactly what he wants, but when he's doing the vanishing point stuff, mm-hmm. that's an illusion. There, you're, You can't walk into the painting. It only looks like you can walk into the painting. And so we want to get rid of illusion, says Greenberg. We want to have flatness. You can't walk into a Jackson Pollock painting. And so now you're armed with the theory and you can go stand before one of the drip paintings and you could say, ah, this is a perfect example of non-illusory, non-3D, whatever. There's the joy of clicking something into its proper category. The square peg goes in the square hole. But, but, But if you hold the theory in your mind... Do you actually even need to look at that painting? Because the only thing important about it is the theory. Right. So the medium is the message. So these art critics who write, typically in the New York Times, have to reduce the painting to something that they can write about. Because they are writing about art, they have to make the art about something that can be written. They have to make it about that or they're out of work. Mm-hmm. And so that's what so that's what they did. You traffic in words. But Wolf is saying that the words come before the painting. In fact, it's not that somebody went and looked at a bunch of Jackson Pollock paintings and noticed this about them. It was that Greenberg, Clement Greenberg, discovered Jackson Pollock, would drag him to the salons, would promote him as an example of something, and then Pollock proceeded to make paintings in accord with that. So the theory comes first, and then you make the paintings in accord with the theory. What's the final cause of the painting? Are you asking me? The the final cause is to match up to the theory. It's not about the potential audience for the the art at that point. Right, right. So there's a marvelous thing at the end on page 97 of the book. Golly, we've covered this one quick. (laughs) We can go back in the middle. Oh, okay. uh, So it was that in April of 1970, an artist named Lawrence Wiener typed up a work of art, typed up a work of art, Wolf is so good, that appeared in Arts Magazine as a work of art with no visual ex- visual experience before or afterward whatsoever and to wit. So here's the work of art. I'm going to transmit it to you through the, I was going to say airwaves, through the information highway. One, the artist may construct the piece. Two, the piece may be fabricated. Three, the piece need not be built. Each being equal and consistent with the intent of the artist, the decision as to condition rests with the receiver upon the occasion of receivership. That's the work of art right there. The words. <laughs> that art's become purely poetry. It's become, except it's not even, well, it's not even good poetry, but purely an expression of words at that point. 
I don't even think it's poetry, Carl. I mean, if it's about, so he reduces this to this written, you know, formula here. And that's what art is here on page 97. But most of this book is about sort of the history of taste making uh, after the center of the, yeah. uh, of the visual arts world moved from Paris to New York City. And he really tr- describes how that taste making process took place once the the center of this world had moved west. And uh, he describes a very small circle of people, probably no more than, frankly, probably 50 people, and certainly not any bigger than 200 in New York City who hung out in uh, weird lofts in certain neighborhoods, and then the hangers-on who would want to hang out with these cool people, cool, air quotes, and then the artists or the art critics who would write about them. And those art critics were either writing for the New York Times or maybe working for the Museum of Modern Art, the MoMA there, which was new in New York City. And those people created an incestuous business marketplace for a product that, frankly, no one wanted. And because they had the bullhorn that was the New York Times, uh, they ended up being um, Bernaysian influencers and got people in other places like maybe Chicago or wherever to buy in to this modern art movement. Yeah. There's nothing democratic about this. Not that there's <laughs> anything great about it, but the, like the marketplace of potential consumers of art never voted on this. Is that fair what I just said? I think so. You left out my favorite word in the book, Kulturberg. Mm. Yeah. This little tiny city of the people who know. I mean, I remember seeing some picture of, uh, I think it's Andy Warhol and Mick Jagger and some model right. sitting on a couch. And the model is so happy to be there with, I, I believe she's actually paying more attention to Warhol, which is kind of funny. It's a waste of time for that lady. <laughs> He's probably not interested. Yeah. But that's like Kulturberg right there, you know? I don't even, th- gosh, I don't think the Rolling Stones are any good, oh, well. frankly. But I think they were the one you were supposed to like if you were cool. Right. But, I mean, that's that's another fight. I, I just, the guys, Mick Jagger, you know, he's the sort of singer that you don't like unless somebody tells you you should like Mick Jagger. Keith, Keith Richards is a fantastic rock and roll rhythm guitar player. Okay, okay. But in what way is Mick Jagger good? Yeah, he's, he's just Jaggerness. Just listen to, uh, what is that song, Angie? Angie! Oh, yeah, it's so weird. Oh, oh, you're hurting me, man. That's, that's a great song, though. He's not, but it's a great song. I do have moves like Jagger, though. <laughs> They're seizure-like, though. <laughs> but yeah, but, I mean, that's a picture of, of Kulturberg. You know, that's like, um, what was that in the 70s? That, what was it, Studio 54? Right. You know, these fancy places off of New York that would establish a taste for everybody else. And this is a view into that in the art world. He's got a line somewhere in here about the Martian or the man from Chester, PA, would only see a series of watery lines because he doesn't have the theory. Right. You know, this stuff didn't sell very well because it's not pretty. Nobody wanted it. There's, there's, he, he says that there are like 200 potential buyers for these pieces of art at some point in the book. Let's talk about their discussion of realism right up early here in the book, page five. In fact, he says the idea from these modern artists, the idea was that half the power of realistic painting comes not from the artist, but from the sentiments, the viewer hauls along to it like so much mental baggage. Well, I certainly don't buy that. What do you think the, what do you think that the value of realistic painting is? Hmm. I tried to make a list of what I thought the value of, great pieces of art was or were or is I realized I'm not sure but one of the things I wrote down that there was an enormous value just merely in the craftsmanship of the thing they are so finely wrought you can appreciate them regardless of the content okay so when you see that Michelangelo has sculpted the veins on the back of the hand and the foot of David yeah that took some doing that craftsmanship says something amazing it points to the amazingness of 
of the human being, the fact that they have the capability to do that. And I think that goes for any art. It could be fine furniture. The joinery is so careful and so well done that whether you like the chair or not, you can recognize that the joinery is superb and that the person who did it was extraordinary in doing that. And I think the craftsmanship is important. Is that important? Sure, but it's more than furniture. Sure. So what else? So you look at, um, I, I keep bringing up that that statue. It's a, it might be the best sculpture ever done. I don't know. That's my. Probably is. It's like nine feet tall. I've never been to see it because I haven't been to Rome yet. Um, Pope Francis has not invited me. Uh, <laughs> keep checking the mail. Uh, but uh, to go up and see it, um, it's just a big naked guy. Mm-hmm. standing there getting ready to throw the the stone, to sling the stone at Goliath. What are you supposed to get out of it? Uh, I believe that the artist is selectively reproducing elements of reality in order to influence your senses to bring you to a particular conclusion that he or she wants to magnify. Hmm. Hmm. So is there a propositional content to David? Premise one, premise two, conclusion. Uh, yeah, I think he wants to emphasize the power and beauty of the human form. Maybe he's saying something about bravery or boldness. Uh, and maybe he's saying something, maybe he wants to say something about content of biblical stories. Okay. He's shining a light on those things, I think. What does it add to have it done up in marble rather than to see all of those qualities in the humans walking around you? Well, he freezes that in time. And like you said, uh, uh, David in that statue is in the wind-up, right? The wind-up happens too fast. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't see the tots in you and coiled steel and potential energy for long enough, for long enough to study it if you watch a great athlete in the backswing of a, to hit a golf ball maybe, or, or even to sling a rock. So he's able to, you know, freeze that moment in time. And then there's something about the permanence of the stone that gives permanence to uh, that, that whole aesthetic and those ideas. Ooh, I really like that. So by putting this uh, idealized young man into marble, you're making him almost eternal, or at least as eternal as such things are. Yeah. Elevating it, um, magnifying it. So... Realist art, especially if it's beautiful realist art, it's like, so I like poking around on art renewal and looking at all these paintings. And there's a guy named Bougereau, I th I believe. Cajun guy? Uh, I don't know that he's Cajun. Uh, he might be French. Just paints a whole bunch of country scenes of, it's, it's usually girls, you know, these painters, they like to paint girls. Just doing their wash and stuff. It, just ordinary, ordinary stuff, but it's beautiful and then could it be that it cycles back so that when you see your ordinary folk doing ordinary stuff that you think oh this is beautiful too that by having it isolated and cut out and put on canvas or carved in marble that when you go back to look at the, the things in your life you can see well, well this is really neat so for me, realist art, for me, it's about beauty. It's revealing something that you won't necessarily see when you're walking through the day. Yeah, because they, they selectively reproduce reality in a way that brings your attention to things that they wanted to bring attention to. Yeah, but they're things. There's actual things that they want to bring your attention to, not theories. Right. And they might have theories, but it's still a picture of somebody. And these moderns, for in, in, at least according to Wolf, I think, would say, look, you know, you're actually looking at a painting. It's, it's paint on a canvas, or you're looking at a rock. It's really not David. It's just a rock. That's what they say. The whole thing is an illusion, and as such, it's busted. It's an illusion because it isn't actually David. And uh, if we could find David and uh, measure him with a scanner, he probably didn't, he didn't look like that. 
He didn't look like that. He didn't think he was nine feet tall. No, he was not nine feet tall and and jacked, <laughs> probably. And uh, uh, and they said, so the whole darn thing's an illusion. So let's actually look at rocks. You know, let's actually look at paint and canvases instead of looking at these illusions. They had to write twelve hundred words for the Sunday paper, so they say this shit. <laughs> <laughs> because they have to fill 1,200 words, and they're not smart enough to say anything about real art, uh, would be my guess. So they say, you know, you know let, let's quit fooling ourselves, and let's quit playing these games of illusions, and let's actually look at canvases and paint as its own thing without respect to any illusion or selective representation or reality. It's gross. <laughs> And I think that the art that they describe is the product of just mediocrities. These are people that can't do these other fine things that that I appreciate. It takes a lifetime to do that. All right. Let's try to defend them. Who? The moderns. The art critics? Yeah. I, I think the critics are the problem here. I always want to be open. Not so open that I accept everything. Right. But what are they reacting against? What is so bad about realism? I literally don't think it's a reaction i think that they are that they have a deadline to meet and they have to create original content to put in the old gray lady for the sunday paper so the medium is the massage because you're working for the new york times you have to format everything in the way that fits the new york Times. that's right and you know and what are you going to say about michelangelo's david pretty awesome i walked in i was awestruck it's beautifully done like what are you going to say about that that hasn't already been said like, notice the veins. I might say, notice the contrapasto stand. See, I know some fancy art terms. Sure, but but why are we going to say about that that hasn't been said before, though? That's the thing. They have to put out original content, and they can't do it. So for me, art criticism, if were I an art critic, I would be, well, even then, I probably have to, could I do it without theory? Because what I want to do, so I just sent you a link to uh, uh, the young shepherdess, this little William Adolphe Bougereau, a little country scene. My job as an art critic, were I an art critic for the New York Times, I would say, hey, there's a really good piece of art in uh, Mrs. Think- Smith's drawing room in Cincinnati, Ohio. You ought to go knock on her door and ask if you can see her painting. You know, go, in other words, they'd be pointing to good stuff. Say, yeah. look. And then I might point to look at, like, I don't know, look at the way he incorporates the curve in her posture there. That's kind of interesting. I'm not sure what he's expressing, but I, I, I might point out some things just like we do in symphony number no. three in the podcast, which just came out today of Beethoven is point out the, the triad in the beginning and the dissonance and what he's doing so that you can see the original painting better. But am I doing the same things they're doing? No. In what way am I different? Well, if you say go to Mrs. Uh, Smith's, you know, parlor in Cincinnati or whatever, you you are making an effort to do taste making. But if you say, I saw William uh, Beaujolais painting the young trad wife from 1885, <laughs> uh, <laughs> shepherdess, whatever, and then you say this is why I think it's wonderful, and you address it for what it is. I think it's different. So I don't want to fit it into a category. I don't want to say this is an example. Well, it's hard to do it without theory, you know? Yeah. It, it's hard to do without theory. Maybe it's that some theories are good and some are bad. Well, I think that's true. You know, you, you mentioned the contrapasto. You guys can look this up. It's a classic uh, posture that heroes would take in Greek and even in Roman statue, right? And then the, the Roman stuff, right? Derivative, right? They're copying that Greek stuff. Yeah, but that's like copying Charlie Parker. Yeah, Come it's on. great. I mean, I wish I could do that. But there's a reason, like the proportions in those paintings or in those statues that use that posture, that contrapposto posture, are pleasing. You know, we could probably get into, hmm. you know, just like we had a little, a little bit of music theory talk with Michelle Hawkins and the Beethoven thing, we could probably do a, have a little talk about the golden mean, you know, a little geometry and describe why these proportions and why framing these paintings in certain ways makes them more visually appealing. And there is some art theory behind these things I think is measurably verifiable. All right. I, I want to go back to something you said in the middle of that. You said it's pleasant. 
Mm -hmm. Maybe that's enough for art. Sure doesn't hurt. Like, maybe that's ultimately what it is, and that's what makes good theories and bad theories distinct. For me, the bad theories are telling you, you should like this because it's important. Does anybody say that the flatness of the paintings, which was Greenberg's big thing, is it pleasant to look at flatness? Is that why you go to the modern art wing of the Art Institute in Chicago? I, no, nobody just looks at note paper. No, and... they all go through the Impressionism stuff, and they say, ooh, pretty flowers. And then they go through the modern art, if they do. It's usually not that crowded. Like The, the Renaissance and the Impressionist section, that's my local great art mm -hmm. uh, repository. The older stuff's crowded. The modern section is where you can go and take a nap. You won't be disturbed. <laughs> They start to lose me at Impressionism, by the way. I like Impressionism. But yeah. they're going a little far. It's a yeah. little bit free jazz. But it's still an impression of something rather than they have those Pollocks. They give me nightmares. You know, like, what's the point? Yeah. Why did you do this? Where's it? I don't get it. But I'm told that I should get it. And that bugs me. If the worksmanship, the craftsmanship matters, and I think it does, for Carl, Scott and Carl, could, do you agree with that? Sure. There's number one. Two, there has to be a pleasantness in the thing. Yes. Wait a minute. Is Munch's The Scream good art? Um, it's got some craftsmanship. Uh, it is depicting something kind of ugly. Yeah. I think, I think it's good art. It might be modern, but it meets some of my criteria about selectively reproducing elements of reality in order to focus the attention of the viewer on a particular thing. Okay, so maybe not necessarily pleasant. And so what I'm thinking is the uh, the introductory track to our own podcast, mm. Mars, the God of War, but da -da -da -dun 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 -dun, depending on who's conducting it, it can be real ugly. Yep. Well, because it's about war. So it's a depiction of reality. It's bringing your attention to something. And it, for me, that piece of music moves from the ugly and dissonant to the beautiful and joyful and back again. It's probably on purpose. Mm -hmm. So maybe pleasant isn't the right thing to say. Maybe clarity? I'm going to yeah. steal from Aquinas. Clarity is part of beauty. It's showing me something. How about, how about pre-modern? So Munch is maybe a little Munch monk. I don't, know. I don't know. Maybe he's a little modern. Uh, you got Goya. Oh, my goodness. Kronos eating its, its young. <laughs> right? Yeah. The 3rd of May, that painting the 3rd of May, the people just being executed. Dark stuff, but moving into something true and interesting about the human experience that needs to be said, I think. Yeah, or Caravaggio, uh, who may have been a murderer. Uh, his stuff is fantastic. Uh, El Greco. Mm. I love that. That So this Greek guy moves to Spain and starts painting, and nobody can pronounce his name. Let's call him the Greek. El Greco. <laughs> it's like El Guapo. You know, <laughs> go get the Greek. And he's got all these stretched out paintings. What's the early, early Renaissance painter that did all that sort of surrealist stuff? Um, Hieronymus Bosch? B Bosch, yeah. That stuff is weird. Super weird. Like, what the hell is that guy trying to say? <laughs> but I think it meets my criteria. criteria. He's using his craft, and he's creating a, a selective representation of reality or even an altered reality in order to deliver a message to the observer and in terms of the visual arts i think they should probably transcend language so you don't need to know a theory you don't need to know a theory to know that bosch is pretty awesome i'm doing this in terms of music and there's some billy holiday song about uh Sh hush freak. now don't explain the man has come home and she doesn't want him to say where he's been mm. she doesn't want to know and you know where he's been it's like walking after midnight patsy klein yeah. It's beautiful and it's done with craftsmanship and it's about something really painful and awful. And I, that led me back to the Greek tragedies, which are also art, are they not? Yep. They have craftsmanship and they're all about murder and mayhem and horrible stuff. So pleasant, I'm just discarding my category of the pleasant. Sophocles is better than Shakespeare, don't at me. <laughs> uh, I just picked up a bunch of Folger Shakespeare. Yeah. About to dive into Henry the Fourth. I want to meet Falstaff. Anyway, I think we've defined what we think art is, and this modern stuff isn't that. 
And on page 16, he says, during the 1960s, this entire process by which Le Monde, the culturati, scout Bohemia and tap the young artist for success who was acted out in the most graphic way. Early each spring, two emissaries from the Museum of Modern Art, Alfred Barr and Dorothy Miller, would head downtown from the museum on West 53rd Street down to St. Mark's Place, Little Italy, Broom Street, and Environs, and tour the loft studios of known artists and unknowns alike, looking at everything, talking to one and all, trying to get a line on what was new and significant in order to put together a show in the fall. And well, I mean, my God, from the moment the two of them stepped out of the 53rd Street to grab a cab, some sort of boho... <laughs> Boho radar began to record their sortie. They're coming, and rolling across lower Manhattan like the cosmic pulse of these theosophists would be a unitary heartbeat. Pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. Oh, Danville, Uptown. By all means, deny it if asked. What one knows and one's cheating heart and what one says are two different things. So it was that the art mating ritual developed early in the century in Paris, in Rome, in London. Berlin, Munich, Vienna, and not too long afterward in New York. It became about being picked by tastemakers because the value of the stuff was not evident to consumers. It didn't contain a theory. You couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't know if it's any good unless somebody tells you it's good, and we need somebody to tell you. It's a metaphysical problem. What is this so-called modern art actually for? What is it for? <sighs> Well, what would be the benefit in getting rid of realism? Because, all right, so this is, we were told that aluminum foil hats are better than tin foil. Yeah. Okay, so Jackson Pollock was a CIA asset. He was funded. Mm -hmm. Rothko, too. Right, so the U.S. government was into, into modern art. So I'm sitting here looking at this pretty young shepherdess. Yeah, William Adolph Beaujolais painting, The Young Shepherdess of 1885. Yeah. Subtitled, The Trad Wife. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, what benefit would it be to anyone to take that away from me? Skanky thoughts don't have to compete with a, a, a persistent image of The Young Shepherdess. Say that again? Skanky thoughts, T-H-O-T-S. Oh, don't then have to compete with this persistent image of this natural beauty. What is a T-H-O-T, Mr. Hamburg? T-H-O-T, that hoe over there. So the Instagram girls that uh, take the pictures of their butts and uh, do like mining and uh, so on, those would <laughs> like be called mining. thoughts. They're trying to get that little chemical boost when they get 1,200 likes when they take a picture of their rump before they go out on Friday night. If you break notions of persistent notions of what is beautiful, good, and true, then it becomes easier to not. It becomes more acceptable to not comply or conform with those notions of what is good, beautiful, and true. So if we break that in people's minds, they have no yardstick whereby to measure those things that are ugly, false, and mean. Yeah, so that's the tinfoil hat thing. You know, I'm thinking, I like beauty, and I think people don't like that I like beauty. Yeah, that makes me a little bit angry. And I'm not making up the CIA modern art movement connection. You all can look that up yourself. Um, that's not me being crazy. <laughs> this is actual stuff. Yeah, yeah, Freedom of Information Act, it came out that they – and they had a uh, – in that same program, they had funded Pollock, Rothko, and some jazz artists as well. You know, you talk about when jazz went off the rails in 63 to 67, something like that. In my opinion, yes. Maybe it was Ornette Coleman. I, I can't remember, but you can go look it up and you'll find that they had actually uh, funded some of these way out jazz artists and frankly destroyed the art. Yeah. So I want to take us on a left turn, literally. Mm. So Wolf talks about from 30 to 41, they didn't do this stuff. It was social realism, socialist realism. I love socialist realism. I do too. I feel bad about it because it's communist, but but what do I like about it? It's you know it's all these young swole blonde kids on tractors pointing to Stalin's glorious future, you know. But it's clearly propaganda. But where I think it is right, it's it still has form, it still has color, and it's directed towards an end. You know, it'd be wonderful if the collective farms were like that. It's like a fairy tale. I don't know. I like fairy yeah. tales. If you ever go to Rockefeller Center in New York City, that thing was built in this period, right? 
in this uh, socialist realism, social realism period. It's an Art Deco masterpiece, that thing. Over the entrances of the building, there are these um, carvings in relief. Uh, and there's uh, at the 45 Rock entrance, there's a commemoration to the workmen of the center. And so there are all these healthy people operating the crane and setting the stones and bucking the rivets and, and so on. Not communist. Mm-hmm. But it celebrates the people who had the craft mm. and the knowledge and the ability to create this glorious human thing, which is that building. And I love that about social realism. It's it's not all about Uncle Joseph, for me anyway. Uh, social realism lasted in Tulsa until the 60s. And I'm not kidding. Tulsa, during the oil boom, in the, in the, in the, would have been in the 20s and the early 30s, built more Art Deco buildings than anywhere other than South Beach in Miami. We have an enormous number of Art Deco buildings with all these terracotta sculptures and, and uh, friezes and reliefs around the entrances of these buildings. And uh, we have the fairgrounds, the Tulsa County Fairgrounds Pavilion has all this social realism art about the, the world of agriculture that I think is just amazing. And we have the Golden Driller. We've talked about the, the yeah. Golden Driller before. And he's just this just this narrow-hipped, broad-shouldered workman standing proudly by an oil derrick. He's proud of what he does, you know, and he's admirable for it. And I just I just love social realism. All right. Maybe you're making me feel less bad about my love of it than that I'm loving a thing differently than I think I am. Have you ever been to the Mitchell Corn Palace? I have not, but I, th- I like the idea of it already. It's in South Dakota. It's just It was built in 1892. It's a celebration of corn. I'm it's it's it up, an yeah. exhibition hall, and they make art out of corn every year. There are corn murals on the outside. It looks like a Moscow mosque. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. It's kind of neat. I mean, you can go inside and buy corn paraphernalia. Lots of corny stuff in there. And there are concerts there. Johnny Cash played there three times, so says Wikipedia, whom I trust on this fact. But it's worth, if you're driving through South Dakota, if you're going to the Black Hills from Illinois, you'll you'll go near it. It's the glory of the farmer, which there is glory. It goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, that you liked uh, Tom Wolfe and, and McPhee. What was his name? John McPhee, yeah. Uh, because they were writing about real life and the beauties of real life. And it's, you know, it's not Kulcherberg. Yeah. You know, this, I used to love Paul Harvey. Oh, Paul Harvey. Also from Tulsa. Yeah, and Chicago, eventually. Well, he moved here. He moved but, here. Uh, <laughs> That's stolen. <laughs> Read these little stories about people from the middle. Yeah. There's a whole lot of beauty in the middle. And they don't buy Jackson Pollock paintings. You know, they buy the painter of light. Yeah. Who everybody likes to poop on. I like to poop on them. I don't, the color's too much for me. Yeah, I hear you. But it delights people. What's his name? The painter of light? Kincaid? Thomas Kincaid. Yeah, it's a little garish for me. He's definitely got technique. Not a lot of variety. It's a whole lot of like little cottages well lit from the inside with thousands of candles glowing on the snowy landscape outside. Uh, you know, my mother-in-law loves it. She's got it in her place. It's all right. It's something. Yeah. Not for me, but it's something. Well, there's three guys. He thinks, in the end, he thinks there are three great artists of the 20th century, and none of them painted. It was uh, Greenberg, whose big idea was the purity of the flatness. It was Rosenberg, who was action painting. Uh, And whenever I hear that, I think of, um, if you've seen The Big Lebowski, the scene where the woman, I forget her name, is on a gurney, like on cables, zip, like a, a zip line, naked. And she comes rolling into the scene right over the canvas and drips paint onto it. That's her painting style. It's very much abstract expressionism. But expressive of what? I don't know. I don't know. And then Steinberg, who was the guy that popularized pop art, which would be Andy Warhol and Lichten, uh, what is his name? Lichten, Lichtenstein? Lich, Lichtenstein, yeah, Roy. Yeah, the big, like the big blow-ups of the cartoons. Which I'm in favor of, by the way. We'll get to him in a minute. You like your Lichtenstein? I do. But do you like it because 
Do you like it for the wrong reasons? So you could like it. Like the Bellamy brothers. I love you for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> There's right reasons and wrong reasons. So uh, the pop art, says Wolf, was a reaction against abstract expressionism, which wasn't flat enough. It wasn't pure enough. We're going to make it more pure. We're going to do art about symbols. Because mm-hmm. symbols are even flatter than brush strokes in paint. Like Liechtenstein did something called brush strokes. We want to get beyond that. So we're going to do art about symbols. So you'll have like a, an American flag be part of the art. And if you saw the art of the American flag, like Jasper John's flag, that's on page 69. Well, do you like it because you like his representation of a symbol of a symbol? Or do you like it because you like the flag? Right. So Liechtenstein, do you like it because he's... Postmodern and and doing art about symbols, or do you like it because they're good looking comic book people blown up to nine feet by twelve feet? Yeah, I like it because I'm a simpleton. Um, he, uh, <laughs> it's it's a ton of fun. It's a ton of fun, and he uses that new medium to to say something about. Uh, I think it says something about the human condition a little bit. You know, you got these. You know, this man and the woman in an embrace, and she's got like a single tear, you know, and it's a comic book theme or uh, styling at least. Mm -hmm. But it says something, and I'm not getting too meta. I'm not going to try to think about whether it's commentary on Rembrandt or Pollock or anything like that. (laughs) You just see these well-wrought images, you know. In this yeah. embrace, and they and, and there's always a caption on those things, and then somebody expresses some sort of angsty thing, and there's a single tear running down her cheek, and I don't know, I like it. Shoot me, I don't know. <laughs> well, so on seventy two, uh, Wolf quotes Steinberg saying, "Whatever else it may be, all great art is about art." Yeah. I don't think so. It's about reality. I think this young shepherdess that I have up on my screen is about the young shepherdess. Or, or young shepherdesses everywhere. Or color, or it's like a fall color scene. She's got some branches in her hand. It's harvest time. She's slumped over. Maybe she's been working hard all day, doing whatever shepherdesses do. She's a little pensive. You know, it's To me, it's about what it looks like. Yeah. It's not a commentary on Rembrandt. You're such a rube. I know. I know. I'm very lowbrow. Have you figured this out? I like fart jokes, too. I do, too. <laughs> So he says, whatever else, whatever else it may be, all great art is about art. And then Wolf says, Steinberg's evidence for this theory was far more subtle than convincing. Sophistry, I believe, is the word. He rejects the guy's arguments. And, and I do too, and he, he actually restates some of the arguments here. He says, to be against what is new is not to be modern. Not to be modern is to write yourself out of the scene. Not to be in the scene is to be nowhere. I think that is the project of, of modern art. Well, this whole postmodern movement is to, you know, like we said earlier, it's to break the persistent notion of what is good, beautiful, and true that can, people can hold in their minds from clear images like the young shepherdess so that it makes it more difficult for them to evaluate things against that standard they can hold in their mind easily. But it's also to marginalize people who do not blindly embrace those things which are new. And so I want to read it again. So Wolf says, to be against what is new is not to be modern. See, it's a syllogism. I love them, man. Not to be modern is to write yourself out of the scene. Not to be in the scene is to be nowhere. I think that's part of the project. I think that people like Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg, these art critics, maybe they didn't overtly have this in their minds, but I'll flip it. I think they wanted to be somewhere and they wanted to be someone, and they had to create an arena in which they could do that because they could not do it. Well, they couldn't paint. They couldn't paint. They couldn't do it in a world of realism. They couldn't. They could not go toe to toe as writers with someone like Tom Wolfe. So they had to create an arena whereby they could be somewhere and could be someone. Yeah. I think this is the art of the social reject. <laughs> I think this is the art of the degenerate and the outcast. How about that? Resentment, as Nietzsche would say. Maybe. Yep. Resentment. We can't do the beautiful, so we will make the not beautiful be the good. Yep. Yeah, you were talking about uh, the comic books, the Lichtenstein. That's a lot of consonants in there. Yeah. Um, the pop art stuff. I have occasionally read some comic books. And just for volume of really fantastic art 
There's a whole lot. I mean, comic books are a mixed bag. But I, I've recently read, you're going to laugh at me. The nerds in the audience will say, yeah. But I read uh, five volumes of Alita Battle Angel or Battle mm. Angel Alita, which is this. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, mock me. Uh, oh, it's good. it's like a, a dystopian future anime thing. Uh, I probably got the terms wrong for Japanese comic books, whatever it is. I think he was 19 when he started Manga. Uh, drawing these things. And it's kind of ludicrous. It's all cy- cyborgs, people putting their heads on other bodies and everything. And the main character is this cyborg girl who's been made to be a warrior and she doesn't know who she is. And, and the story's kind of ridiculous. But there are just some scenes in here, some little sparse line drawings that you just stop and you look at like oh my gosh that is just it's really fantastic yeah but you know it's not art (laughs) right it's not important no i think it is i mean it's an enduring art that people will be uh protecting and stewarding a thousand years from now or 300 years from now. I, i don't know about that but it's art there's a continuum of art from uh the pleasing and fleeting to the immortal you know, and just because it's more pleasing and fleeting than well, David, we ought to talk about the problem of permanence and archiving and all of that at some point. Mm, you know, yeah, what makes something worthwhile? Why can I look at the young shepherdess right now? It's because whoever had it kept it, right? And it gets noticed enough that it gets scanned into the digital database, and it's accessible, and and there's a whole lot of wonderful representational art that that nobody's ever going to see. So how do things get preserved? Which yeah. for me is also part of what I think is the dark side of, of this modern art movement is they're going to pick what gets in the museum. Right. It's not your local school council or your your local town council deciding what's going to go into the... I don't know. We went to a museum in Cuba, Missouri last summer, which had all the stuff that the Cubans, not actual Cubans, but <laughs> Cubans from Missouri thought was neat to have in their museum like little programs from band concerts from 1928 wedding dresses and i thought it was really neat none of this stuff would make it into the museums in kulturberg right but i didn't want a taste of kulturberg i wanted a taste of central missouri (sighs) kulturberg yeah that's a great word kulturberg a few podcasts ago, Carl, I mentioned seeing a uh, piece of modern art in the, the Kansas City Kansas City's Nelson Atkins Museum in 1993, which was a fur-lined cup and spoon. You remember mm-hmm. me mentioning that? Yep, it's in the book here. He mentions it on page 33. He says, "All we ask for is a few lines of explanation," and I wrote, "No." <laughs> Next to it, <laughs> you say Moray Oppenheim's fur-covered cup, saucer, and spoon of 1936 is an example of the surrealist principle of displacement. You say the texture of one material fur has been imposed upon the forms of others, China and tableware in order to split the oral, the tactile and the visual into three critically injured, but for the first time, fiercely independent parties in the subconscious. Fine to get to the word was to understand blah, 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 blah. Any work of art that can be understood as the product of a journalist says Trist, Tristan Dada's, manifesto do you know about dadaism yeah so all right it's kind of fun you'd have three people go up on a stage okay and one of them's going to read from henry the fourth and one of them's going to read from ayn rand's night of january whatever her play is and somebody else is going to read from the phone book and uh the weird thing is if they start uttering their lines with conviction your mind will start to make it make sense So it's interesting as an exercise and showing something about consciousness, but it's not, I don't think it's art. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. I wrote here at the margin, these people should be ridiculed. (laughs) And And I mean that. They're absurd. The things they assert is absurd. They do it with the most earnest expressions on their face, and they use the biggest mm. vocabulary they can, and they try to impart some sort of legitimacy on it, and the things they say are Ill- illegitimate, and I think as responsible people that love the good, the beautiful, and the true, we should make fun of them and ridicule them and take their ability to uh, put themselves to create a uh, society where they're relevant, take it away from them. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Shots fired. Yeah, I, I think uh, I might just ignore them and look for beautiful stuff. My favorite moment in modern art is when the Banksy painting shredded itself right after the sale was closed at the le- at the auction. Right. I thought that was beautiful. I don't know who Banksy is, but I I love him very much right now for just for that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it, there was a shredder built into the frame of the painting. And Banksy was watching from somewhere and as soon as the auction closed and the million dollars went for the painting, He's an unknown person. Nobody knows who Banksy is. And triggered the switch and made it destroy itself. The primacy, it's not the painted word. It's the printed word on the dollar bills. Dear listener, we, you probably don't know this. But we just had a bathroom break and I, I, I had an idea when I was in the bathroom. I often have ideas in the bathroom. We need to raise money so that we can, uh, we can secure some of these pieces of work like Oppenheim's fur-lined cup and saucer. And then we'll we'll be able to get a museum together, and then we're just going to ridicule them all these pieces. We're going to put the thing on a little pedestal and have a big sign over the top of it about how <laughs> stupid it was and how a little hot glue and a little bit of fraud uh, made this guy a living. And then juxtapose it against like a mean vase or something you know that's like beautiful and wonderful. What would be the name of this museum? Oh, it's the Hamburg Museum of Art. I was thinking the ridiculium. <laughs> okay, I like that better. Well, no, it could be the Ridiculium Wing at the Hamburg Museum of Art. Yeah, I like that. It's going to have graphic novels in there. <laughs> it's going to have... We're going to buy the Golden Driller and put him in there. Sure, to preserve him. Yes, in the in the atrium. It'll be seven stories tall. He'll be in there at the atrium. Uh, but back to your Banksy thing. I think that's really interesting is what Banksy did art there. I, I think it is. I think it's. Um, it, it became an interactive play when he did that. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting. It's it's not going to be a persistent thing, you know. You talked about the persistence of art or the permanence. It won't have that, but he certainly made everyone that was aware of that story. Um, he he directed their attention selectively to something he wanted them to know. Mm-hmm. I think he did that very well. It's not abstract. I don't know how much craftsmanship is in it. In installing the shredder. Yeah. It's crafty as hell. That's for sure. It's yeah. clever. Uh, whereas I, where I think uh, a Pollock painting isn't particularly clever. Yeah. So this is where I think modern art should go. We're, you're always talking about what's the next big thing. I think the next big thing is the ridiculeum. Is well, right after the ridiculeum, right after ridicule, comes recovery. Mm. Okay. You make fun. You realize that look, the emperor has no clothes. This is all ridiculous and then maybe you go back and you learn how to draw Mm -hmm. you know maybe you go sit and you study uh rembrandt and learn how to do the things he did with color maybe you do it with digital art but you go back and you learn from the people who knew the stuff Mm -hmm. so for me the the future should be recovery of the past obviously i work at online grade books we read old books on purpose what i mean i'm thinking what thoreau said about it you read the great books because they're the, what does he say? It's like the, the record of the noblest thoughts that anyone's ever mm. done. Yeah. You don't get better than them. You learn from them. We don't need to transcend them. We need to get back to them. I think it would be great if in 2030, the the Museum of Modern Art is full of realist art. It's not going to happen. Well, it might be the Museum of Modern Art, the Modern Art Wing of the Hamburg Museum. Mm. Right after yeah. the Thomas Kincaid Gallery. I'm not going yeah. in that one. I have to I put mean, sunglasses on to go in the Kincaid Gallery. The painter of light. The, the whole notion of modern art, I think, just trips you up from the very beginning. Sure. Art is art, whether it's modern or not. Yeah, is there anything not modern about the David? No, it blows you away. Good art hits you right between the eyes, and it doesn't matter how old it is. How much have we actually talked about this book? <laughs> we used it as a jumping off point. It's an easy read. It gives you a bit of the people who are the big names in 20th century art, which probably won't be too important to you after you read it, unless you are into that scene yourself. But as a story, as a narrative of the progress of 20th century art, 
I think it's valuable. I mean, it's got little stories in it that you wouldn't know, like like Pollock showing up at the party and peeing in the fireplace. Just being a blackout drunk. But getting invited back to the next party. Because nobody had the nards to tell him he was awful. You know, they were so interested in being in that he would let that guy pee on their carpet. Like, how broken were they? That carpet really tied the room together. <laughs> He talks about this pop art as being uh, ironic in camp. Carl, I hate irony and I hate sarcasm. I just hate it. Uh, that whole ironic sensibility prevents people from um, like home, having values uh, that they can express actively. It's just, it, it, it just constantly react. It's not a positive thing. Yeah, you're always detached. You never enjoin, you just react. I thought Wolf's comments about pop art were interesting, that people were secretly enjoying the pop art for the realism. Yep. Like, when I look at Andy Warhol's little bits on Marilyn Monroe, I'm not liking it because of the weird things that he does with the print. I'm liking it because it's Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, because she's beautiful, and he puts it, and it's colorful, and it draws our attention to more to Marilyn. Here's uh, page 78. He's got one of these Lichtensteins. We Rose Up Slowly is the name of it. You can look it up. It's on Google Images. It's a man and a woman. Looks like they're underwater in an embrace about to kiss. And it says, we rose up slowly as if we didn't belong to the outside world any longer, like swimmers in a shadowy dream who didn't need to breathe. Now, look, if he's shooting for iron irony, campiness, a literary and intellectual assertion of the banality, emptiness, and silliness of culture. I don't care. <laughs> I think it's lovely. Yeah. You go through the irony. You go through the, what is it, the essential aperture of the irony, and you come back out the other side. Yeah, that, that looks pretty good. I was thinking that that would be a perfect picture for your Instagram. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I haven't posted anything in a long time. Oh, I know, I know. This is Charity and Scott. This is like, you know, a weekend. Yeah, you can go fall, go, go look at... So on my Instagram, uh, for quite a while, I was posting these pictures. I, I would find these... I love pulp art. I like the I like the cover art from pulp novels, like action novels, like lad lit, they used to call it. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, for a long time, I've, I found those. I saved... My phone is full of hundreds of them because I just love them. And uh, I would send them to charity, and I'd say, "This is a uh, this is this is us right after we met when we did this other thing, you know." And uh, and I and I started. I showed she had shown some of them to some of our friends. Were like, "This is amazing." So I posted uh, ten or twenty of them on my Instagram, Scott underscore Silver Strength. You'll see, see those silly things. I like it too. I like it because I like it. I don't like it because it's mocking anything. I, I, irony mocks. Sarcasm destroys. I, I don't like it. Wolf says, for what in the world requires more courage than to applaud the destruction of values which we still cherish? Modern all art always projects itself into a twilight zone where no values are fixed. Uh, he's actually quoting Steinberg here. Uh, but, that, I mean, they just state their, he states his project. Oh, he thinks it requires courage to applaud the destruction of values we cherish and that modern art projects itself nah. into a zone where no values are fixed. It's what it's, teenagers do all the time. This is not courageous. But real humans mature beyond that. Right. Into a creative part of their life where they where they create. You know, that's what that's what marriage is, that's what having children is, that's what paying the mortgage off is. It's creation. Mm -hmm. But not these clowns. <laughs> yep, you're not being at all ironic or sarcastic here. No, I think they're a bunch of clowns. They're a bunch of fools. And I think that they couldn't get traction in the way that normal people do with life. Now, maybe they could, but they didn't feel like they were to the task or something. Well, and if this, was, out. if this was just the weird stuff that Bohemians, I love that word, um, has nothing to do with real Bohemia, uh, in some neighborhoods in New York City did, mid-century, it'd be fine. Okay, go do your experimental art. Go drip paint on a canvas. Go do action yeah, painting. Go sure. do flatness, whatever. If it's any good, we in the middle, we'll find out about it. Yeah, quit trying to run it up our ass. But it's it's made the official art of the cultured class, and that bugs me. 
Yeah. And, and if you're not in, you know, like, uh, I guess you don't count. I remember I used to watch television. I'm sorry, dear listener. But there was a show called 30 Rock. And uh, it was set in New York City, of course. 30 Rockefeller. They're just making this joke, like the ordinary looking characters on this show, they go to Cleveland and everybody thinks they're the most beautiful thing in the world. And one of the characters says something like, yeah, west of the Hudson, we're all supermodels. And I thought, they're not really joking. This yeah. is really what they think. Mm -hmm. That once you get out of New York City, that the rest of the country is a bunch of rubes. Hey, listen. I saw a girl at in I know Oklahoma at Hay Day in nineteen eighty seven. I ain't never forgot. <laughs> you know? Yeah, there's beauty all over the place. And you don't necessarily need the New York Times art critic to tell you that it's there. Right at the end of the book, Wolf says uh about people of the future. He says, What happy hours await them all? With what sniggers, laughter, and good-humored amazement they will look back upon the era of the painted word, uh, which is this art art era from forty-five to seventy-five that he describes. Yep. They won't even know about it. <laughs> they won't listen. Hard times come sometimes. <laughs> sometimes hard times come. Wars, pandemics, London burns sometimes, like the whole damn thing. And uh, do you grab the Pollock? When the city's being sacked? Nope. Or do you grab uh, The Young Trad Wife of 1885, that painting? Well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're not going to grab the Pollock. And, and deep down inside, Greenberg and, and these, other, these other art critics, well, the, whether they know it or not, when the fire comes, they wouldn't have grabbed the Pollock either. So they won't persist. Should they read the book? Absolutely, you should read the book. Yep. It's fun. It's short. Introduction to Tom Wolfe, maybe read some of his other stuff. Uh, he just died recently, hmm. last year, I think. Had a long career. Uh, I have not read all of his stuff. I've read a few things. I've never regretted it. It's a comfort to me that there's a whole bunch of yeah. Tom Wolfe books waiting for me. That guy made a living just being smart. <laughs> yeah. It's a good good work if you can get it. So freaking smart. Did you know the line art in the front of each of these chapters? Oh, I did not notice that. I did not know that. Huh, I see that now. So like his uh his drawing of Andy Warhol here. Yeah. That's Tom Wolfe's drawing of Andy Warhol. It's as good as anything. He knows enough about art to be a fair hand with a pencil. Chapter two. The public is not invited and never has been. That's the title of the chapter. You flip the page and it says <laughs> it's it's a picture of a guy wearing a dinner jacket and a bow tie, but he's got Levi's. He talks about him wearing Levi's and uh, gum boots. Whatever a gumboot is. What's a gumboot? Uh, like crepe sold work boots, I guess. So he's wearing uh, work boots and jeans that are all paint spattered. His arms are crossed. It, I think this is Pollock. I think this is supposed to be Pollock. And it says underneath it, I'm still a virgin. Where's the champagne? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's real funny. It's real funny. Wolf's a treasure. Yeah, I got to read the right stuff. I'm going to put that higher on my list. Wolf slightly postmodern. I mean, because he all he does is comment on other things. Uh, well, I say all he does. I haven't read all that works, but his main thing is commenting. On, I mean, his main stuff is derivative, right? Like he's pointing at other things and commenting on other people's work. Well, all art is about art, right? So, I mean, he's he's sort of part of this movement too, um, indirectly. But he, well, but he's an outsider looking at it. Yeah, I mean, I guess Bonfire of the Vanities is uh, his, his own creation, top to bottom. It's not a journalistic piece of work. But most of his stuff is comment on the structure of things by one mm -hmm. way or another. Uh, I like it. It's got a good beat. It's easy to dance to. I give it, uh, give it two thumbs up. Yep. Uh, next week. Next week, though. Oh, what are we doing next week? Uncle I'm Henry. exhausted. You're going to have to tell me what to look at. Oh, Walden. That's what we're doing next week. Yeah. Henry David Thoreau's book Walden, which is oh. uh, one of my uh, one of my faves. Yeah, I bet you they didn't let us read all of that. They couldn't. You guys would have stood up and walked out. <laughs> right. He tells you every other paragraph to stand up and walk out of whatever it is, whatever it is that's happening. Stand up and leave. It's like they're like, we have to have some Henry David Thoreau because he's an American writer of some importance, but we can't have any of the good parts. Yeah, we can't we can't have the part in there where he says it only takes forty days of work a year 
<laughs> to live the life of a full <laughs> man. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have fun with that. Yeah. I love Henry David Thoreau. That guy has been so influential on me. I cannot state it enough and continues to be, continues to be, you know, I'm, I'm working on my Walden <laughs> yep. uh, uh, project now, you know, and uh, charity and charity and I've been doing that since together since I don't know, 94. Yeah. And you can go see uh stylized paintings of, <laughs> of that on my Instagram. Um, <laughs> hey, there you go. There's an online great books uh, podcast. You can go to uh, Instagram and go to uh, at online great books and follow us there. We announce when the new shows are out. Uh, got some memes on there. Rima and Katie ch- uh, cherry pick some of the best lines from the show and put them on there. People seem to enjoy the Instagram feed, so you might go check that out. Also, go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash OGB podcast and join our waiting list. We'll let you know when enrollment opens soon. Um, and get you 25% off your first three months. And by the way, I was looking at our stats, Carl. We have mm, about 30% of the downloads that a show will get in the first week happen the first day. And the other 70% happen over the course of the week. I think that's evidence that people aren't subscribing. So if you're listening to the show, please Hmm. subscribe. And that way you don't have to go look for it. It'll go right to your podcatcher, whatever that is, whether you listen to it on Apple Podcasts or Overcast, where all good people listen, uh, you'll get that thing uh, hot off of the podcast presses. Overcast does not have an Android client, I don't think. That's terrible. Overcast has this uh, thing they call smart speed, which drops all the silences out between the words. And it'll just speed up the normal podcast 15, 20% without the words actually being faster because it drops the pauses out. Kind of screws up the comedy, by the way. Timing. Yeah, yeah. Kind of kind of screws up the comedy, but it's good. Yeah, so go out there and subscribe, if you would. That'd be a big help to us. And we will talk to you guys next Thursday about Henry David Thoreau's book, Walden. So jump into that. Read what you can of it, and uh, we'll, we'll all visit on Thursday. Thanks. Thank you. Mm-hmm.